the morning after. Only once a month, the man comes down here to the room left hand to the stairs in the basement. It's already close to sunset when he looks at the steel riveted door, slowly breathing in and out. Whenever he feels ready, which he never really does, he turns around, takes a sit on the stairs, takes off his shoes, followed by all his other clothes he wore. Every time he stands there completely naked in front of this ugly, eerie door, he gets goosebumps. Maybe because of the cold concrete floor, maybe because of the shiver that runs down his back. After hesitating another while, he types in the combination to the electronic lock. September 18th, 1684. It beeps and rattles and the door opens. He gets in quickly. One can see the effort in his eyes it takes him to do so. He holds his breath and pushes it out heavily as soon as he has passed the door, shaking his whole body, his heart racing. It smells like fear. Even though the beautiful orange sunset shines through the metal grilled window in his empty bleak room, fear is everything he can think about. Because the sunset lost its value over the centuries he spent in rooms like this, in nights like this. The door beeps and rattles again, now closing the lock. Only to be sure he turns around and pushes against the heavy steel. There is no keypad or doorknob on this side. No chance to open the door until the computer system unlocks it from the other side at tomorrow's sunrise. He looks at the deep notches on the walls around him, retracing them with his fingers. Somehow it makes him feel safe, helps him to calm down, to see all the rage on this walls, unable to overcome them. Then the sun vanishes completely and leaves the star-spangled dark sky alone. He can't see the moon out of the window, but he feels its power feels all the pain as he changes, the full moon's curse. His spine grows longer, warps, his teeth become fangs, his eyes turn black, and finally the brown fur grows out of every pore of his body. It only takes a fraction of a second until the werewolf takes control of his mind and he blacks out, but this is what he hates most of the transformation. After this last view through the eyes of the werewolf, after feeling all the rage and pain, he again awakes in this room, with no memory on the last night. Everything that changes is another scar on his skin and some new notches on the wall. Sometimes he awakes with a broken arm or leg, but nothing like that happened this night. This morning, when he opens his eyes, awakened by the first beams of sunlight crawling through the window, everything he sees is blood. The young woman in the forest was just found about one hour ago. Some jogging guy found her between the trees next to his every morning running road. The policemen took their time to get there. It didn't look like much of a case to investigate. It was an animal attack, obviously. The almost 20-year-old girl was scratched all over her body besides her blood daubed pretty face. So what did you see? One of the policemen asked with a mix of boredom and tiredness in his voice. Nothing. I I just found her between the trees and bushes. What the hell did that to her? Most likely. A wolf, I guess. Or any other animal. The coroner will find out soon. But there are no wolves in this... He makes speech marks with his fingers. Forest? Or any other wild things? There are not even squirrels in here. Well, it seems like now there are. Whatever. You may go now. The policeman immediately turned around to his colleagues. So? Seems to be a wolf attack. There are some brown hairs on her body we need to analyze. Also, do you see the bites over here? He pointed at the big hole in her chest where the heart was supposed to be. For a bear they are way too small, so I am pretty sure it was a wolf. But I can determine my answer after the autopsy. And the wolf just ripped out her heart? The policeman was astonished and disgusted at once. And the ribs that protected it, see that? He raised up some hand-length bone fragments. Very untypical. But however, what else should have done this? Of course, the policeman had no chance to ever find out what really happened in this night, or in all the nights like this in the years way back in the past, when he still lived in his pack. When he called himself Dunstan, not Monster. He found himself in almost the same situation like the girl. 
running through the forest, not knowing what was chasing him through the trees and bushes. But you simply can't outrun a werewolf. So this one brown monstrosity of a man-wolf found the breathless Dunstan, who stumbled over a root and fell to the ground. But instead of ripping out and eating his heart, what they usually do, he only bit him one time in the leg. It didn't even hurt very much, but Dunstan was scared as hell, thinking that his life would end every moment when the werewolf took him up and brought him to a hunter's hut somewhere in this goddamn forest. But he wasn't supposed to die there. He was about to change, for his very first time. The overwhelming pain that comes with the metamorphosis knocked him unconscious immediately. He never really got used to that. But in the next morning, Dunstan woke up after the best slept night in his whole life. For the first moment, he totally forgot about the hunt and the chase through the forest, but only remembered feeling strength and power. On this day, he of course didn't really remember anything. It took him time, and way more changes, until he remembered the werewolf nights. When he again ran through the forest, not chased, not as a man, but chasing a man, or a woman. The foliage and branches were crackling and groaning under his feet, the woman's screams echoing through the dead night forest, he remembered the smell of blood and the taste of human flesh. He always liked to hunt animals, preparing traps, holding his breath when he was about to let loose the bowstring, but hunting human was so much more intense. Seeing their fear in the darkness, sitting in the bush right next to them, counting down for the perfect jump to kill them with his own hands and fangs. The four weeks between the full moon's return, Dunstan stayed with his new family in the hunter's hut. Brandon, Dunstan's new father and teacher, looked pretty similar to his world of appearance. He had long, scraggy brown hair and beard and didn't really like to wear clothes. Most of the time, he only wore this old dirty knee breeches. The first months, it was a fun time to hang around with him and the two other guys. They did what they want, whenever they want, as long as they stayed in the forest. Brandon taught and told them how to use the werewolf strength while being human and how to control him in this one night. You need to be. The werewolf, he said. Accept what you are and let him take the control. If you let him, he will share this night with you and you will earn his power as a human in return. Which turned out to be true. But after about one year hanging out in the ever same forest, Dunstan got bored very quick. Even wrestling with a deer or ripping apart a wolf's head only with pure man force stops to be funny if you do it a hundred times. So Dunstan did what he had to do. Even though the family, how Brandon called his pack, was everything for him, Dunstan needed to leave them behind and so left the hunter's hut one night without ever looking back. He never thought about what the others maybe thought about it when they woke up in the next morning and he was gone because he was way too busy with terrorizing other cities and forests at night. But instead of hiding there and waiting bored to death for the moon rising again, he went to the city Sunday. He traveled through Russia, which he didn't like very much because it was one of the full moons in the winter over there, he almost froze to death. But over there, he just found back to the most nature thing on earth. And after almost a decade of being a werewolf, he again spent his first night in a real house in a small city, somewhere in the cold no man's land. Not alone, of course. This, and of course not the six feet tall snow, was probably the only reason for him to stay over there for the rest of the winter because the Russian woman just had something special. And every now and then, what in his case meant like three to five nights a week, he spent in another city, in another house, with another girl. He really had his fun in this time. He went to Greece, Italy and Germany. In Germany he actually ran into another pack of werewolves and hunted with them for three full moons, but it just wasn't the same like the time with his family. Not that he missed that he really didn't, just thinking about being stuck in this damned forest again made him bored. But in this full moons, he just got nostalgic, which was the reason for moving on. Probably the biggest mistake in his whole life. Because something absolutely unexpected happened. It's always the same thing that turns a happy man into a teary panty waist. He fell in love with a woman. But this woman 
definitely was worth staying for in this little town in the northeast of France. Also, this wasn't the today's France that fought in two world wars without winning a single battle, but it was the 17th century when France was on its way to become the major power of Europe. And you definitely could see that in every muscle she used for her gorgeous smile. And this was all he fell in love with in the first weeks, because he of course wasn't able to talk a single French word at first. But even though he didn't understand what she said, it was her voice that tamed the werewolf with the very first words she said to him. When he sat in this little tavern, hungry and tired from the last travel days he spent in the forest next to the roads. Hi, what can I do for you? She asked. He just looked at her, right into the big deep sea blue eyes. Time stopped. She was not that kind of girl he only wanted to spend this one night with. He didn't even think she was that pretty. There was just something that made her interesting. Maybe just the sound of her voice or the French words she didn't understand. Sorry, I don't speak French. May I have something to eat and drink? She didn't understand him either. So after another funny attempt to communicate with language, he just pointed to the bowl and the glass of another guy sitting in the tavern and she finally understood. The next few days there were also not much talking. Only when he fondled her hips or lips or breasts or any other part of her body, she told him the word. But he learned so many fragments of different languages while he traveled Europe that learning French was much easier than he expected. Luckily, his French was still too bad when he left her bed for the one full moon night to have to really explain what was going on. But also, in the next months, when he went off for this one night, he needed to think about different stupid excuses for his absence. Because there was just no good way how to tell the woman he loved that he was a werewolf without her thinking that he is a monster. Which she definitely was not. The love to her proves that. But what if the girl he loves is sitting in her living room when he comes home, back from the forest, and she just cries because some wolf just killed her best friend in the forest last night. Frazzled her whole body and ripped out her heart. That made him think different about who he was. What he was. It started pretty slow in the first months. When he stepped out of the forest while his fur turned back into his white skin again, and he felt this little migraine. But he couldn't let him kill another one. Not only because he didn't want to see her crying again, but because someday they eventually would wonder about the strange wolf attacks. It was not that he forgot what Brandon told him, he was just too arrogant to follow his advice. But there is simply no way to control the werewolf. If he wants to kill, he will kill. And unfortunately, he knew everything about Dunstan. September 18th, 1684. Dunstan went out to the forest right before sunset, but the thing in sight didn't care. The two meter tall, brown fur man wolf stepped out in the moonlight, not even running, but walking back to the city. Dunstan still saw everything, knew everything his body did, unable to take control of it. It was the last time he killed someone in his entire life. The werewolf ripped out her heart and ate it. Dunstan smelled her perfume, tasted her flesh, and he liked it. Even though he hated himself for thinking that, the werewolf sitting in his mind and body made him like it. Only when he turned human again, regained control about his body, he started weeping, crying. It was the last time he ever killed someone. But now there was this body laying in the forest, and him, blood smeared over his entire body. And while he of course didn't remember anything about her and how she was killed, there was nothing to know anyway. Because he did not kill her. After just sitting around as this little wimpy pantywaist, living from day to day in all these different cities again, he finally got the one thing that was important. It was not him who killed her. It was the werewolf. And his dollar turned into a thirst for revenge. Back in Germany, he returned to the pack he stayed with for a few months. Even though they knew a lot about the werewolf kind, he obviously was not able to ask them directly how to kill the werewolf inside him. Silver would have worked, he knew that, but to kill the werewolf, this way he would have must kill himself too. But they had some books, very old books, written by the first men who made the pact with the devil and became the first of their kind. The answers he found sadly did not suit his oath, 
because the only way to get rid of the werewolf inside him would have been killing the one who made him. It's not that he didn't think about looking for Brandon in his forest, he guessed how long he'd probably need to train to be able to take him down because his anger made him thinking such things, but if he would do so, the werewolf would win one more time. He would kill one more time and even though everything would be done afterwards, it just was not the right thing to do. And he was a man, not a monster. An important thing to not forget after all that happened. So since then, he locked himself away, one full moon after another. And for centuries, he defeated the curse inside him this way. The werewolf wasn't even able to overcome the iron grating prison he locked himself in for the first decades. But somehow, the werewolf escaped in this night. And then, he notices that he is not alone in this safe room. Because the past always catches you. And while Dunstan never thought about what it meant to Brandon when he left, he never forgot when his son was gone. The son he fed and taught and didn't kill in the night he chased him because he thought to see something in Dunstan. It broke his heart when he left. They were family. First he got concerned about that someone found him in the forest and found out who he was, that he was in danger and needed help. But when he found out that he was traveling somewhere through the world, when he found out about his inconceivable betrayal, the chase began once again. Do you see this footprints? The policeman asked his colleague, shining on the ground with a huge flashlight. Like Ducky said, seems to be a wolf. He answered. So, do we need to chase the track? Why? Do you want to arrest the wolf? Sure, you know what? What a good idea. I go back to the office, you will find who did this and put your handcuffs on it. <laughs> he laughed and went away, probably back to the car. The other one immediately regret his question. But... Even if it was just a bad joke, he needed to do what the senior said. Even though he was pissed that he needed to chase the wolf's path through the mud, he was surprised pretty fast when the track led him out of the forest over a green field next to the highway. The footprints ripped out the grass, so it was an easy chase, but it took him quite a while. This definitely was the worst thing he ever had to do in the last three years as a policeman, hunting a wolf's track for more than three miles until he came into a little village. Dawn almost was there. You already didn't need a flashlight any longer to follow the footprints. And when he saw the track leading to one of the houses, he didn't think about that being a bad joke after all, but got really concerned about that the wolf maybe could have killed someone else, wherever he should go over there. He of course didn't find a wolf inside the house, which door was just ripped out of the hinge. He found four of them. First, he heard the deep scratchy voice already holding his gun in his hands. They were discussing about a coat. I told you, I don't remember the date when he killed his girlfriend. I'm sure it was September. Yeah, 18th. So we got it, right? September 18th, 1684. Brandon said, and you could hear the beeping sound of the lock. Hands in the air! The policeman shouted downwards to the basement, who was scared the pants off when he saw the four big wolves. Even though he immediately shot every bullet out of his gun, the werewolves didn't care about that. Because everyone knows that werewolves only can be killed by silver. But for this the policeman needed to know that werewolves really exist. But even though the policeman didn't kill or hurt any of them, he distracted them. And while they looked up and now went up to him, the door behind them swung open. Dunstan, or more likely the angry werewolf he was right now, didn't kill the two werewolves still standing next to the door either, but with all their entrails hanging out of their bodies, it was pretty hard to run or fight. The policeman ran away, dodged the strokes and slashes, bites and jumps as good as he could while reloading his gun to empty it again. It was a mess of a fight. Rex crashing down, furniture cut into pieces, but in the living room, one of the punches finally hit the policeman. He was hurtled through the entire room, blood splattered everywhere. He was dead in the second crashed against the wall, breaking his spine multiple times. Dunstan arrived behind Brandon and a new guy of the pack he didn't know. And behind him, suddenly there were the two wolves with the innards hanging out. Dunstan dodged them, running back down to the basement. The two didn't follow up this time, but Brandon and the other one did. Unable to kill each other without any silver, they scratched each other several times, now fighting in the safe room. The throats, the chest, 
All three of them were scratched and wounded all over their bodies when the sun finally showed up with the first sunbeams and lightened the day and calling out the end of the full moon's night. Dunstan grasps and groans, swallowing blood as he tries to breathe. Because he is too weak to get up, he just crawls to open the door. Trying to get forward with one arm, holding his organs inside his body with the other hand. Leaves the two dead guys, Brandon and the one he doesn't know, like him now human again, behind. Even though he had absolutely no clue what was going on over there only one minute ago, he knows what he has to do right now. It takes him all his left power to get up the stairs, where he finds his whole house devastated. As he comes to the kitchen through the floor, there lies another one at what the oven once was, followed by the fourth and last guy in the middle of his living room. He doesn't even notice the dead policeman laying down at the very end of the other side of the room. Gladly for Dunstan, the cell phone he is looking for isn't on the Davenport anymore, but on the ground next to it. After he climbs over the dead body, which probably ended in being more exhausting than just crawling around him, he barely succeeds to press the green phone button after typing 911 before he passes out again. But this time, he won't change. Nor he'll wake up in his safe room. He never needs to do again.